Welcome back to another episode of Revenue Reimagined. And this is a special one for a multitude of reasons. I, I'm <laughs> sitting next to this fool, which is weird in and of itself. Um, but we have a very special guest today. We have none other than Kyle Coleman with us. Uh, Kyle's foray into B2B tech started in 2013. Uh, he was the sixth employee at a small little company called Looker. Over six years, uh, he grew that SDR team from one to 70 and scaled from 100K to, i reading this for the first time, but a staggering $110 million in Oof. ARR. Um, was acquired by Google um, for $2.6 billion. And now, as most of you know, Kyle is the SVP of marketing for Clary, uh, which is a incredible platform that I've been able to use, not a paid plug. Um, Purpose built to run revenue where he leads marketing, SDR, and all of revenue excellence. Kyle, thanks for being here, man. It's a pleasure. I'm so excited. We're going to start off with a little bit of controversy right off the top. If you were not in marketing, uh -huh. what other part of the GTM function would you decide to be in and why? You, you know, it, it's funny, guys, because I, I really am like a marketer in sheep's clothing here. I, I did not grow up. I lead the marketing team, as Adam outlined there, but I didn't grow, grow up through traditional marketing channels. I, I didn't grow up through product marketing or demand generation or anything like that. As as Adam said in my little intro there, I grew up through sales development. And the, for the first four years when I was at Looker, I was working hand in hand with a woman named Lisa Daniels, who I absolutely love. And she was our VP of demand generation. And so it was me and her just running together, trying to figure things out. I reported directly to the CMO, but I worked most closely with our VP of demand gen. So learned all the ins and outs of, of that whole world. And then for my final two years at Looker, I reported directly to our CRO and worked with our VPs of sales and all of our regional directors and all those things. And so this SDR role is, is always right between sales and marketing. I think 80% of the time it reports to sales, 20% of the time into marketing. It doesn't really matter. Um, what matters most is that they get the SDR team gets the right leadership. But for me, what it meant is that I got to develop this sort of fluency of language for both sales and for marketing. And I got to flex my, I'm a middle child, so I got to flex those muscles as well and do all the conflict resolution and, and process type things between sales and marketing to make sure it works well. And so that's that's what I've carried into my role as a marketer, a head of marketing now is one super process oriented, like really focused on how the sausage gets made. I know that's really important. And a, a lot of marketing team, marketing leaders just don't have that, unfortunately don't have that level of detail. They haven't had to. And then the second thing is you can't run an outbound sales organization by speaking in marketing or marketer's language. You have to speak can, can, common. Can you say that again? Because <laughs> so many, we have this conversation so often with companies that when you're outbounding and you're reaching out to customers, it can't be from the lens of the marketer. It has to yep. be guided by that. But right. marketing talk is very different, right? It's very different. So no buzzwords allowed. Like we need to, we can't make any assumptions that they have any understanding of who we are, or what we do. We need to be super simple, pain oriented, speak their language, solve their problems that are actually top of mind for them and be constantly evolving the messaging as well. And, and this is something obviously you learn in SDR land that message testing has to be an always on thing. And unfortunately, a lot of marketing teams are so in love with the concepts that they created six months ago, 12 months ago, two years ago, and expect that to continue to work today. It's like, guys, look around. The world is completely different than it was two years ago. And so anyway, it's just, I, I like that I have found my way into this role. And I think that I get to take a lot of what was so successful for us. Adam, you mentioned that my previous company, Looker, was $110 million in revenue. 40% of that was outbound sourced. And that's something that I'm super proud of. And that, that was that was kind of our, you know, BI, business intelligence was not a new category. It was a very saturated category. And so we had to come in and do something fundamentally different. And one of our fundamental differences was the way that we approached outbound. And so taking a lot of what I learned there and applying it more broadly to one-to-many type programs in marketing has been, I think, a pretty interesting uh, experiment for us here at Clary. So if you weren't in marketing, would you go back to sales? Like what what function besides marketing? Would it be CS, sales? I, I, I'll think a little, um, maybe more ambitiously, I'll say CEO. How's that for an answer, Dale? Ooh, I like that. We, we, we know what the next step is for you. That's, <laughs> um, That's the goal. That's the goal. I, I want to double click on something you said. Um, you talked about the way you approach outbound. Yeah. And so I have used Clary. I have also led sales for a competitive product. Um, 
which was not as good as Clary, but we'll come back to that. And one of the things I, listen, I could say it. One of the things I've always admired is, and I followed you on LinkedIn for a long time, the way that you approach outbound and the way that you help people approach outbound. Yeah. So a lot of reps, listen, we all get bombarded with cold emails, right? All day long, cold emails, cold calls. And a lot of people will think nothing of taking that rep's cold email, throwing it on LinkedIn, talking, you know, it's awful, it's shitty, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. Who would let this person do it? And you've taken a wildly different approach. Talk to me about that. And wh what inspired you to do that? I've seen so much more value in positivity over the years mm -hmm. than yeah. in negativity that I just, I, I, we needed to change the conversation on LinkedIn. There were, there were too many SDRs and, and salespeople who thought that SDRs were a worthless role because of this unfortunate kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that you would see on LinkedIn, which is what you just mentioned, Adam, where the SDR teams were just getting so unfair, unfairly criticized for work that sometimes wasn't even theirs. And so what I have always wanted in my career is like, I want to own my work so that I can take responsibility for the failures or the successes. And if I fail, I at least want to fail doing it my way. Like, yeah. why would I want to fail just pushing a button that somebody else sets up for me? It doesn't make any sense to me. And so I, I wanted to make sure that there was some positivity, that people knew what good looked like and that it was possible and then explore how to unlock that, the good parts of SDR roles that so often are, are not unlocked. And for me, that is changing the hiring profile to make sure that you are hiring people from diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. not just people who went to a certain school or studied a certain thing or have family members in tech or whatever, but really thinking differently about who you're going to hire so that your team and team is a key word here. You don't want a team of basketball players. It's five point guards. Like you want a team that complements one another. And if they're all cut from the same cloth, you're not going to get the same sort of camaraderie. You're not going to get the same kind of one plus one equals three across the different relationships and cross pollination on the team. So you have to think differently about hiring. And then you have to think differently about enablement. And for some reason, too many teams, companies treat their SDRs as button pushers that are just like basically paid robots to hit send over <laughs> and over again. I'm like, why are we doing that? They need to learn the product. They need to actually be able to demo the product. They need to be trained on how to write. And I don't mean how to write college essays. I mean, sure. how to write outbound emails. It's very different. So actually investing in training and enablement for SDR teams is something that's been near and dear to my heart. And I, I saw it firsthand help hundreds of SDRs that I worked with personally at my uh, couple companies I've been at. And I wanted to see, like, can I make a broader impact? And then COVID set in and I had a ton of extra time. It's yeah. like, hey, maybe you weren't traveling anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So all those things combined, but really just trying to up level their profile and make, make sure that people knew that SDR is not something to be ashamed of. It's not a stepping stone that you're trying to get out of as quickly as possible. It's something to take pride in. And it's something that the skill set endures the rest of your career. I could not do what I do today, as we just talked about, without my SDR upbringing. And I, I need people to realize these skills that you're learning. They're so valuable and they can be applied in whatever direction you want to go at the company. And so that's the goal. And I feel like it's going pretty well on, on LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and it's the hardest, in my opinion, it's the hardest job in tech. Um, like I, I've never been an SDR. I've led SDR teams and like, that's a grind. Like there, it's, it's, it's hard. The people that aren't as lucky to have you as a marketing leader or this, the SDR team is underneath the sales leader. How can you help them? Uh, how can you help them like bridge that gap back into the marketing world? What are the, what are some of the tips and tricks that you would have to help them like level up their game? It's a really good question, Dale. And it's a, it's a difficult balance for a lot of uh, early in career people to strike or people that are new to tech because on the one hand, at certainly more mature companies, you're kind of given a playbook. And if you step outside that playbook, it can get a little dicey. And so my, my advice to them is do what you were told to do, like check all of those boxes, but try this new way on the side and start dedicate 5% of your time to this new way. And by new way, I mean, personalized, deep research, bespoke, you know, one-to-one -one messaging, like, let's try and take this really personalized approach and execute that 5% of your time just to start. The other 95% of your time, do, don't get fired. Like, keep the lights on, don't get fired. I used to run SCR teams. And one of the things I used to like to do is on Fridays, I would give them like an hour, like, go write anything you yeah. want. Go try to like test that stuff out. And I think as leaders, it's our responsibility to enable them to like 
broaden their reach a little bit, like not always be underneath the thumb of people. Um, so I, I really love that advice. It's empower and enable. So change the expectations. We didn't hire you to be a glorified button pusher. We hired you because you have a brain and we want you to use that brain in XYZ capacity. And so if you're fortunate enough to work with a leader who has this more modern way of thinking about it, take full advantage. Love if that. you're under the thumb of somebody who's older school, like I said, start with 5% of your time and then increase it 10%, 20%. Soon your results will speak for themselves and you can go back to your manager, whoever <laughs> it is, and you can say, Hey, look, show the results. Yeah. here's option A and here's option B. I promise option B is going to be more effective in the long term. And so you, ju you just have to prove it and you have to show some of these older school managers that there is a new and better way of approaching this work. I agree with that hundred percent and data <laughs> speaks for itself, right? You know, when you go to your manager and you are able to show them what you've done, they're a lot more willing to let you continue to experiment. But there's this whole new thing that's coming into play that we've all heard about called AI. Um, and we've seen people say, oh, it's the death of the SDR, right? Like you don't need SDRs anymore because, you know, the AI is going to write the email just as good. And it always starts with, I hope this finds you well. Um, and you've, I'm sure you've heard the Tesla call with air that I, I don't know why everyone thinks it's so great. I happen to think it's horrible. I think AI will get better, but like that yeah. call didn't impress me. From your point of view, like where does AI play a role and what then happens to the SDR role and then deeper what happens to sales? The AI is here to say, and it's something that we should not shy away from as a profession. The, the, the folks who invest in learning about AI and its use cases will be better off than those who don't. So that's a very important caveat to issue before I say this, which is AI is meant to make the menial tasks disappear or to speed them up considerably. And what are the menial tasks? Account research. I don't need you to go in and read an entire 10K. You upload that PDF to whatever AI robot you want and say, give me the bullet points. Like that's one example. So account level research can and should become much, much faster. So automate the menial tasks so that you have time to put more thought into the strategic tasks, which is the emails that you write. Like I, I don't see, I've never seen, and maybe it'll happen someday. It probably will, but it's not there right now. I've never seen an AI write a, an actually good email. I've seen AI give good suggestions mm -hmm. on what to change in an email for the sake of improving response rates or open rates or whatever it may be. But I've never seen a blank page problem be fully solved by AI. If you need a first pass, cool. Right. Ask the AI bot, hey, I'm reaching out to a chief revenue officer. They have XYZ pain point and they're interested in basketball, write me an email, see what happens. You're going to get a C plus email and then you can go and if revise that. it if yeah. that, and then go revise it to make it an A, make it an A plus. And so that's the balance right now. And, and what I hope will happen if we can automate more than menial, provide time for more strategic is not the death of the SDR. It is the rebirth of the SDR Ooh, through right. the lens of full cycle sales. Yeah. And I hope we get to a point where entry level or, you know, the, the, the starting point for tech sales careers is full cycle again, you know, kind of going back to where we were 20 years ago. Is yeah. that the path you think it's going? Cause that's interesting. Cause you're, you're touting the BDR, but it's like, now you can be full cycle rep and still be that kind of entry level. So how do you, how do you justify those two parts of it? Like BDR, yeah. full cycle. It's a good question, Dale. And it, it depends on the business model. It depends on mm -hmm. your uh, segments and who you're selling to and your ASP and the complexity of your sale and all those sorts of things. Like will a uh, uh, first time, first year SDR be able to go and close a Fortune 500 deal? No. But can they go and run the four figure deal that just, you know, kind of like a quasi PLG type motion? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so that that's the vision that I see. And, and that's the, the world that we're bringing to life here at Clary is we have enterprise, uh, we call them RDRs, revenue development, enterprise RDRs who are working hand in hand with enterprise AEs trying to prospect into large accounts. But at the same time, they're handling the inbound demand for some of our uh, kind of ancillary product lines that don't necessitate white glove service from a super seasoned AE. And it's a great way to go sell a call recording solution that we call Clary Copilot, go sell that call recording solution to the three person sales team, go close that deal. Like I it's low, that. it's low stakes for, for us. It's not necessarily the best use of time for, you know, the 500 K OTE rep we have, like yeah. go, go do it.
Get your hands yeah. dirty. So, and then so, that's- so now everyone's going to apply to Clary now that you've said five hundred. <laughs> Ky- Kyle's inbox is about to get flooded. <laughs> so I think that's the that's the future that we imagine, and that's what I hope happens because that is that's what buyers expect as well, and that's a really important lens to apply. Is what are the expectations that buyers have? Buyers do not want a gatekeeper that is just scheduling appointments, and this is what drives me crazy. You, you go inbound to get to talk to the SDR. <laughs> well, it's so annoying to me when like all, you see some of these thought leaders or whoever it is on LinkedIn that say, oh no, the, the SDRs are going to suffer from this curse of knowledge. If you teach them too much about the product, they're going to get all tongue tied on, on discovery calls. I'm like, mm. what the hell are you talking about? The more you teach them, the better conversations they're going to be able to have. And that's what buyers want. So teach them the product. Teach them how to demo. This is what our RDRs do. They're, you know, handle an inbound lead. Inbound lead says, I want to see the, the demo right now. Right now. Okay, cool. Let's jump on a Zoom. I'll give you the five minute demo, like we're at a trade show booth. Yeah. And then at the end, if you want the fuller 30, 45 minute spin through with an SE, we can set that up. That is what buyers want. Cause think, yes. think about it. Like, and I, I had this happen the other day. I was looking at software for a client of mine and I get on the phone with, the SDR, who then tells me, to your point, we need I need to schedule time with you for the AE. And he used the words for a discovery call. Like, no one wants a discovery call. No one wants the Spanish Inquisition. But what, <laughs> what people I think do want, generally speaking also is, and I'm curious where Clary plays into this and your thoughts is consolidation, right? Yeah. So you talked about Clary Copilot. There's sequencing tools, there's revenue tools, there's forecasting tools, there's 27 different platforms. I have a client of mine who has 36 different tech, tech platforms <laughs> they're using, 36 logins. That's for the sales team. Um, yeah, that was my work. <laughs> People are tired of that. So you, you, you have Clary, there's tools like Outreach, there's tools like SalesLoft, there's tools like Gong. I think everyone is trying to be this platform. Yeah. How do you differentiate yourself specifically to, to Clary or to, to anyone, to any rep selling and really get customers to understand the value of being on one platform and alleviate the fear of shit. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and there's a, a couple of different threads to pull here. One is just what are the virtues of consolidation? 36 different revenue tools is out of control and probably not terribly different from what you'll hear uh, for listeners who are hearing this. They're like, yeah, I got that too. I saw a stat that was like sellers spend like 11% of their time just switching between yeah. apps, like We're logging not. out, logging in, 11%. tabs in a browser. It's like 11% of your time. Oh my God. So we, and the, the, we've done, we've over specialized with tools. We've over specialized with roles, as we just talked about, kind of the SDR role becoming more of a full cycle role. And it's time to unbundle a lot of that specialization mm-hmm. to be really honest with ourselves about what are the need to haves and what are the nice to haves and what are the, the essential workflows that we need to try and uh, solve and make easier, more effective, more efficient. And what are the things that we're like, good enough is good enough on this front. Mm-hmm. And so what we, Clary, have tried to do is we've, we, you know, we keep our finger really close to the pulse and we have an awesome customer advisory board with all these unbelievable CROs and heads of RevOps. And we asked them that question, like, what are the things to you that are, you cannot compromise on? If we took one thing away from you that would guarantee you got fired, what would be that thing? Great. And one. 10 times out of 10, guys, it's forecasting. Like yeah. CROs cannot, they, you can't miss the forecast. Right. And if you can't stand up in front of your executive team, if you can't stand up in front of your board and have credibility in the number that you're calling, the rest does not matter. Nope. I don't care what sales engagement tool you use. I don't care what call recording solution you have. If you can't get the number right, you're not going to be employed for much longer. And yeah. so we, Clarion has invested in really robust and in-depth multi-currency, multi-hierarchy, multi-org, all these different complex ways that companies have to run revenue. That's my shirt. All the different ways that companies are running revenue and how that bubbles up into a forecast. And I don't mean forecasting just as like a bottoms up spreadsheet roll up exercise. That is not is, it's way more than that. <laughs> it's understanding all the retrospective analytics. It's having predictive analytics. It's doing really tight deal reviews. It's doing end of quarter sequence of events, get this deal across the line calls. It's, it's running revenue like a business process. And the outcome of that is a trustworthy, incredible forecast call. And so that, that's the workflow that we've really optimized around. And we've added 
a handful of other products and capabilities, including call recording and mutual action plans and automated data capture and a bunch of other things to our platform. But we we want to make sure that the main thing remains the main thing. And that for CROs is always going to be forecasting. Love that. Uh, forecast is super important. So one of the big um, parts of, of Revenue Reimagined is giving back to the audience and community. And you've been grateful, gracious enough to uh, provide something to the audience once you share it with the audience. Yeah. So we just started running. We uh, acquired a company about a year or so ago called Wingman. And we have fully integrated it across our revenue platform. The product is now called Clary Copilot. And it's call recording, but it's so much more. It's not just a glorified note taker that's sitting in the background of calls and then that you maybe go back and listen to, maybe, but in all likelihood, you probably don't. It's much more active than that. So it's uh, listening in real time to your calls. Live battle cards pop up when keywords are said. Um, automated summaries are generated using generative AI so that you can send the follow-up email immediately. Super um, well-integrated game tapes are surfaced as you're doing deal inspection. So when your VP, CRO, regional director, or whatever is doing their forecast call, they can see the call recording right there and see key snippets from it. So we've really thought deeply about how can call recordings be made actually useful for revenue teams, not just reps, but reps all the way up to execs. And we've embedded that across our core platform. And we're giving away a free trial of the Clary Copilot product right now. So if you're interested, just go to clary.com and you can find the free trial there. That's pretty that. cool. So I want to make sure I heard you right. So if I'm in Clary and I'm doing a forecast review and I'm in a particular deal, right in there, I could get key, key snippets of the call to call bullshit or not. That's right. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I love that. I love so that. sales isn't easy, right? Marketing certainly isn't easy, but we try to arguably find easy ways to do things and kind of hit that easy button that I used to have <laughs> in my office that my kid would come in and like think it was the coolest thing in the world to hit. But I think that, you know, there's this avoidance of wanting to do the hard work and wanting to kind of scapegoat your easy way, the easy way out. And I know one of the things that is important to you is the importance of doing the hard thing. Why is that? Talk talk about that a little bit. Because I think too many people are like, oh, mm -hmm. shit, that's hard. I don't want to do that. And I'm with you. I think that's the wrong answer. I would arguably say the harder it is, the more you should dig in. But I'd love your thoughts. Yeah, for sure, Adam. And people are looking for the silver bullet. People are looking for the shortcuts. And I, I feel like sometimes they're disappointed with some of the things I post on LinkedIn because I'm consistently saying there are no shortcuts right. here. Like, Sorry. I'm not going to give you the subject line that guarantees a response and guarantees a meeting because it doesn't friggin' exist. So the, the people that are obsessed with trying to find shortcuts and trying to find the easy way of doing things are avoiding the hard work. And this is 99 out of 100 people, by the way. The one person out of 100 that goes and does the things that are hard and does the things that other people are not willing to do, those are the people that are successful. And so like, make the cold calls. Practice the cold calls practice, pull a VP of sales out of your org and role play with them. Like put yourself out there. You embarrass yourself. Yeah. Be willing to fail. That's Adam does it all the time. Adam of course. Himself every day. <laughs> but if you think about that, so I I've been the VP of sales. Dale's has, Dale has wanted to be the VP of sales. Um, but if someone were to come up to me and be like, Hey Adam, could I get 30 minutes on your calendar to role play? Holy f dude, you just went from here to here on my list. Yes. Because you want to level yourself up and make yourself better and you're willing to put yourself out there, but no one does it. Right? No, one no one does, does it. that. More broadly, let me say, in my career, and I'm sure you guys would echo a similar sentiment, nothing that, and when I look back on my 10, 11 years in tech, the things I'm most proud of, without exception, are the hardest things. It was nothing that I thought about for five minutes and then executed in 10 and was like, all right, on to the next thing. I don't remember any of that stuff. I remember the stuff that was blood, sweat, and tears. The things that we tried a million ways and failed a million times and then found that one right way and then made that the thing. What's it's like the number one thing that comes to mind when you say that? Oh my God. There are so many different things. Like I had no idea what I was doing, what we were doing early in the outbound sales days. No right. idea. And so we did all sorts of, we did the whole traditional playbook thing. We bought the lists. We did all the technographic. <laughs> we bought all the data providers. We did this thing. We're like, screw it. What's the thing that nobody else is doing right now? 
Nobody is actually, go- and this was 2013, so it sounds obvious now, but nobody is going on LinkedIn and like doing the personalized outreach, doing research on people sending one note at a time and trying to get responses to that. And so we figured out the right way to uh, build a process around this and like, what are the right five, six steps you need to take checklist format to go and execute this outbound strategy. And then we found ways after trial and error to make this scale across what was first just myself and then a team of five people and then ultimately a team of 70 people. And how can we like keep this engine rolling? And it was this constant battle of bottoms up evolution and trying new things and running into brick walls and LinkedIn changing the way that in-mail credits worked and email right. providers changing the way that blacklists work. And we were always like on the forefront of this and, and just being willing to not compromise on the, the main thing, which was personalization, one-to-one meaningful relationships. We're not compromising on that. And so we need to constantly try and find how we're going to reinvent our process to be successful without compromising what is so important to us. And so I, I look back on all the different steps that along the way from 20 th- every year, probably, and maybe frequently or more often than not multiple times per year and all the different ways that we had to go and run into a brick wall and then find ways around over through that wall. And it's the kind of stuff that fires me up. And it's a lot of what you see now, like these, these tactics, they change, they evolve, yeah. but they're not wholesale difference. Like treat no. people like people do real research, add value. It's not rocket science, but finding ways to scale that and finding ways to train and enable a, a global team around doing that is, you know, there's complexity there. Do the foundational things really well. Yeah. We say it every time with, with every client we work with yep. without, and it's funny, whether you're an AE, an SDR, or the CEO of a startup who is a first time founder, arguably, it's always, well, well how can you come in here? And in, in, in three days, we're going to walk out and we're going to have a humming go to market engine. That's right. You're not. Right. Um, you, you have to build the foundation and put in the work no matter what the role is. So I th- it's amazing. And you see this with professional athletes too, which I think ha- there's a lot of really nice parallels with, with salespeople and Tiger Woods was this way where he would be on the practice range way more than he was actually on the 18 hole course. And when somebody asked him about it, they were like, what are you, what are you doing out here? Why don't you go play more? And he said, I enjoy practice more. Like, this is what I like to do. I think you practice as much as Tiger Woods. I see a hole in one uh, plaque in the back. So, <laughs> yeah, that was me just play a little golf. That was me fishing for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Kyle. As we um, as we wrap up, I want to throw some rapid fire at you um, and just kind of get your thoughts. <laughs> okay. um, I'm nervous. Don't be nervous, uh, or maybe be nervous. All right, what song would best describe your revenue strategy? <laughs> uh, Time to move on by Tom Petty. Ooh, I like that one. That's a good one. Yeah, I, heard that I, one. I always say I'm waiting for the person to come on and honestly say living on a prayer. No, oh. it's it, time to move on. Like, qual in, qual out, keep it yep. moving. Six months, everything changes anyway, right? No, That's right. Um, That's right. If you had a crystal ball, what's one trend that actually is not going to be a trend and is going to be like full on board in the next 12 to 18 months in revenue? Yeah, I, I don't know how, how much you all think that personalization has permeated the sales process, but I, I will say one-to-one outreach yeah. is it has to be the way back to if basics it, man back to basics if it doesn't become the way and so what i also hope comes back is in-person type things mm. i think digital channels are going to get so inundated that you know yeah, ai you're not going to be able to have an ai come and host uh, you know some sort of in-person dinner so i i hope that in-person type things come back because that's a real relationship that's real community and i i love that stuff and maybe it's personalized event, yeah. not these big uh, Salesforce events. Every, yeah, exactly. Every, I'm talking like six person dinners. Yeah. yeah. Listen, Saster's great. Dreamforce is great. But to your point, the best conversations I've had that have really moved business forward for both parties mutually have been four to eight people in a room breaking bread, having real conversations, put the sales bullshit aside. And let's just talk about like human beings about how we can help one another. Um, love that. So revenue generation, you could only choose one. You could only focus on customer retention or customer acquisition. Yep. Which one is most important moving forward and why? And not, not for Clary per se, just broadly yeah. speaking. Yeah, um, it, it, it depends. I would say right now, given the macro environment, customer is probably the, the focus area that makes the most sense. And it's not even for net new uh, revenue creation. It's really for retention. You spent 
God knows how much money to get that revenue in the door. And for it to just disappear like that is not acceptable. And so I'm seeing CROs who normally index toward new revenue acquisition. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing them more often than not index really heavily toward the customer side of the house, shore up account scoring, shore up renewal health, shore up expansion and cross-sell revenue, because that is the fastest path to revenue right now. And, you know, hopefully we get out of this downturny type situation we find ourselves in and, and we can index back toward new logo. But I think it'll be a really good thing for custom, for companies to have their post sales house in much better shape with a lot more rigor than they've had. Do you know a platform that could help with that? Just out of curiosity? <laughs> no, yeah. None come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always a pendulum, right? We're going to pendulum swing to customer yeah. acquisition. I mean, customer success and pendulum swing back and like, we'll, we'll get back to the middle, but um, I do see that happening. So earlier in the show, you mentioned that you said you'd be the CEO of a company if you're going to be in a different revenue uh, role. It's tomorrow morning. What's the first thing you do as CEO of the company? What What do I do? In my yeah. first My first yeah, act as as CEO: um, implement a revenue cadence. And a lot of times, uh, this will be the job of a CRO. But you know, maybe at this small company, I don't. I'm not. I don't have one yet. And what is the revenue cadence like? I mentioned before that revenue can and should be treated like the most important business process that you have. It mm -hmm. is, yes, it is still art, but there's a lot of science to it. And you need to embrace that science and you need to implement it and run revenue like a process. And so what are a lot of times there are, there are internal workflows, there are external workflows, all of the internal workflows you have, a lot of times they're going to be meetings. And so what are the meetings that you need to architect and orchestrate Every day, every week, every month of the quarter for your individual reps, your rep manager one on ones, your QBRs, your forecast calls, all of these key moments. And you don't need to, you know, blow your calendar up and fill every second of every day. Of course not. But making sure that you have the right structure to hit all the key points when you need to and to make sure that whoever you have on your team is hitting all the key points when you need to. And me as a CEO of this fake company, I'm getting the insights that I need to when I need them is is really critical. So implementing a revenue cadence to run revenue like a business process would be mission number one. Love that. Love it. Kyle, thank you so much thank for you. giving us half hour of your time. Shameless plug time. Where can people find you? Where can people find Clary? And why do people want to find Clary? This whole thing has been a shameless plug. We're not just starting. <laughs> oh. <right now. laughs> Clary, C-L-A-R-I.com. Check us out there. Um, the, the only purpose built revenue platform that can do all of these things, run all these workflows that we talked about. And we're adding some pretty exciting things to the platform here in the coming weeks. So I wish I could say more. I cannot, but watch this space. And then, um, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn for some strange reason, feel free. I'm just Kyle Coleman on LinkedIn. The best handwriting on LinkedIn. That's right. That's I, right. I, I, you know, I used to work at an advertising agency before I got into sales and they turned my handwriting into a font. Ah, That's very cool. cool. Fun fact. Um, as someone who has used Clary, as someone who has used other platforms, and as someone who has led sales for another platform, um, do yourself a favor. Check out Clary, clary.com. You won't be disappointed. Kyle, thanks so much for joining us, man. Thanks, gents. Thank you.